welcome back again to the final session of the algo trading conference of 2022 and uh, the last session by dr chan was uh, full of uh, insights where he shared glimpse of his current project that he is working on and i hope it was a good learning experience for you all um uh, uh, for the fifth and final session of the day uh, uh, that is on how to lose money trading options uh, we are joined by dr ron singler from chicago united states so Hey, Dr. Singler, are you here with us? Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, perfect, perfect. So uh, I'll just uh, make a quick introduction. So Dr. Singler uh, is an industry expert on stock options, interest rate products, volatility products, index options, and commodity options, both exchange traded as well as OTC. Uh, he specializes in design implementation and risk management of quantitative trading strategies uh, dr sinclair uh, sinclair has uh, authored uh, three books uh, which are positional options trading like the latest book then option trading and volatility trading now uh, uh, i think uh, uh, now i'll be uh, making dr sinclair the presenter so that he can share his screen Okay. Are we ready to go? We're ready to go. Yes, yes. Uh, we can see your screen and yeah, we can start. So I'm going to turn off my camera and the stage is yours, Dr. Sinclair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I didn't realize I was the last person in the conference. It's probably appropriate that I am because what I'm about to tell you may be perceived as very negative. Uh, it also has nothing to do with algorithmic trading which is something I'm going to come back to at the end because that's an important point I want to make, I want to make clear. Um, I also don't think that this is negative. Uh, if you, you can't be perfect as a trader, but if you don't try to be perfect, you're not going to be good, good enough. The small, a lot of what is known by professional traders is known to everyone. Like literally all, all the big firms are doing the same thing. You can read about it in books. I've written books and there's no secrets being held back. I can tell you exactly what we do, what differentiates you from someone who makes more money than you is almost always the details. So what I'm going to do here is go through a number of very common mistakes that options traders make. And I will admit I did this on a day where I was losing money, so I was in a bad mood but you don't have to take it that way. Uh, and I'm also gonna say very very much up front, I'm not immune to making these mistakes. Some of these mistakes are very closely tied to psychology. And even though you know you're doing something wrong, it isn't always easy to correct that. But on the other hand, if you know that you're doing something wrong, and I'm gonna tell you specific things which are wrong, then you can work to correct them. So I do hope this is helpful anyway. Uh, it is somewhat aimed at, I wouldn't say it's aimed at retail traders. It's sort of aimed at people who have a background in options and are looking to take it to the next level. Uh, some of it will be aimed at directional traders, but a lot will be more general than that. Okay, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. These are the, the sum of the mistakes people make. Uh, I realized when I was writing down this list, I could have added another 20. Um, these are the big ones that I could think of. Uh, you probably write a book about all this stuff, but that will not be me. Okay, so the first one we're going to be talking about is the situation where you don't actually have an edge in the market. There is no way you can consistently make money trading unless you're buying things cheap and selling them expensive. Now, one would think that that's an obvious statement. And to a lot of directional traders trading stocks or futures, it should be. I mean, the reason you buy a stock is because you think it's going to go up. You think, based on that, you think it's literally too cheap now and will adjust in the future to not be so cheap. With options, people get confused about that. They get confused about this idea that 
by choosing a particular option structure, say an iron condor or a, uh, a ratio spread or whatever, that the edge is in that. And nothing could be further than from the truth. You need to have an edge in the actual price of the options. The structure itself, if anything, is an extra danger. It's very tempting to try and design an option structure where you think you can't lose money. And that's the most dangerous kind of all, because all you've done is push the risks to a point where you can't see them. Um, so you're actually better off, possibly counterintuitively, having structures where the risk is obvious. Um, so for example, a very simple example, uh, the iron condor, where you buy a far, far out of the money strangle and you sell it closer to the at the money strangle. And you do that because you don't think the stock's going to move very much, but if it moves a long way, you don't want to lose so much money. You are correct in the individual case that you can't lose an infinite amount of money in that one trade. However, if you repeat that trade enough times, you can easily lose all of your money. If you're buying those far out of the money options for the wrong price, you're doing a bad trade, structure or not. So you need a real edge. It's sometimes said that risk control or discipline is the most important thing in trading. Again, this is utter garbage. If you think that is the truth, I challenge you to go and buy lottery tickets with the risk control that you'll only buy one a week and the discipline that you'll always buy one. Again, unless you have edge, you will not make money. And the other thing is you get paid in the market to do things that are difficult. It's actually pretty easy to manage risk. You basically cap your downside, you size things correctly, and you look for situations where you can be wrong. And even in the most catastrophic situation, you don't want to lose all your money. I mean, this is a very, very simple thing to do. Discipline is frankly something you need to have in all jobs. Um, if you're working as a barista at Starbucks, you need to have the discipline to get up and go to work every day, not snap at your customers, not steal money from the till. Discipline is the sort of thing any reasonable adult should have. These are easy. So finding edge is hard. That is the differentiating factor. Okay, now to find edge, again, is a big mistake people make. People think that their personal qualities qualify as edge. They'll say things like, I'm a hard worker. Well, I mean, so what? So is the guy who fixes my air conditioning. Doesn't mean you can trade options. Everyone needs to work hard. You're smart. You've got a PhD. Again, who cares? It doesn't matter how smart you are. It matters how you can apply that. And oh, if you're smart and you can use that to find edge, great. But being smart on its own, Again, who cares? And I've known plenty of traders who are, I mean, certainly possibly of above average intelligence, but I wouldn't say they're qualified as well. I would say smart. Um, fundamental analysis. You read the newspapers, you interpret the news. You really think, given that you're reading news from someone else who's already digested it, you think you can find edge that the market hasn't noticed. Possibly, but exceptionally unlikely. Uh, most macro funds, professional macro funds, do not make money. Um, the other thing here with, well, I'll get back to this. Technical analysis. So you're looking for patterns on charts. You're plotting an RSI and a moving average, and you're looking for when it dips below the lower Bollinger Band or whatever. These have been tested by real studies, academics doing real studies very carefully. It used to be said they didn't make any money. Now thinking somewhat evolved that they can make money if there's no transaction costs. So it's possible, again, very unlikely. What you will get paid for is the same as you will get paid for in any other walk of life. You have to do something that provides a service to the world. You have to be actively offering something to the market. You get paid for doing a job. 
If you have a very concrete plan, such as what I've written here, you spend hours cleaning data, you construct every pair in the US equity space, you look for situations where there's a significant supply in, uh, or a buy or sell imbalance, and then you know that that can come out of line, the spread, so you trade those spreads. That might work. This involves a huge amount of infrastructure and data, and that's what you're getting paid for. You're not getting paid to read The Economist and decide what you think the war in Ukraine is going to do to oil prices. Okay, so once you've got your edge, you might then think you're going to start trading options. And you'll do something like, I think the market's going to go up, so I'm going to buy some calls. That is only the start of your problem. You have to, when you're trading options, remember volatility. Implied volatility gives you the price of the option. It's literally the price of the bet you're making. Even if you're right about direction, if you pay the wrong price for the option, you're not going to make money in the long term. Um, it's like, look, I think this is a pretty safe bet. I think the Bears will lose to the Packers. Okay, but will I take, you know, I don't know, an even money bet that the Packers would win? I mean, no, I'd take like, I'd actually be giving odds would be better. You've got to have the right price, right? If you think, ah, okay, it's even more so on the long volatility side where people are confident, are like, look, my downside is capped, I'm going to buy these calls, all I can lose is the premium of the call. I have no downside beyond that. Again, it comes back to the fact in any one position, you don't have any downside. On the other hand, if you make that mistake every time you do a trade, eventually you're going to go bankrupt. Options do have that limited loss and unlimited doubt upside, hence convexity. On the other hand, if you're paying the wrong price for the option, you don't get that convexity. Sometimes people think this only applies if you're going to sell the option you bought before expiration, because then you'll be exposed to implied volatility. But you're also exposed to realized volatility no matter what. Even if you think the market's going to go up, there's a big difference between betting on a 10% rally if the market is going to be volatile. That gives this about a 60% rally 4.8% of the time. You've got real blowout potential in this case. But if volatility is only 20, well, at that point, the chance of the 60% blowout rally is very, very much lower. Whether you think you are or not, if you are an options trader, you are primarily a volatility trader. This is actually good news because volatility for a financial variable is very predictable. On the other hand, you actually have to, again, do the work to predict it. It gets worse than this. Not only do you need to predict volatility, you need to be aware that volatility changes with price. So I've done a picture here which is the change in the VIX versus the change in SPY. For those of you who get angry when people uh, express changes in the VIX in percentage terms, uh, I don't know, get over yourself. It's perfectly legitimate to have express something that is a percentage. You can express its change also as a percentage. Um, there's nothing mathematically incorrect with that. You can say, you know, the uh, unemployment rates 5% and then it doubled. Everyone knows what you mean, that's perfectly legitimate. Um, as with all things, you should choose the units you're working in to be relevant to the problem you've got. So in this case, I literally wanted to know what percentage change in the VIX would there be if the SPY rallied or broke. And you can see here, if SPY goes up a lot, volatility comes down a lot. And again, you might think, well, that doesn't matter if I'm going to sell my option, but it does, because it means that as you make money, as the market rallies, and you're right, volatility is going to come down, and the chances of a further big move in your favor will diminish. So you're getting punished for being right. Um, and that's something people often don't take into account. 
they, you have to monitor volatility, not just initially when you do the trade, but all the way through the trade. Uh, you may think, well, in that case, if I buy a put because I think the market's going to go down, I'm going to benefit from that increase in volatility, which is true to a certain extent. The problem is everyone knows this. The market makers know this. Um, you have to realize most of these things are very well known. Hence, because people know that the volatility of a put will increase as the market goes down, puts are priced accordingly initially. So a put will be initially overpriced, but a call tends to be, turns out to be overpriced during the trade. Okay, so when I've said these things are known, I want to come to the topic of the black swan. Black swan, by the way, is a phrase I don't like for a couple of reasons. Probably the biggest one is sort of irrational here. Uh, I'm from New Zealand. I didn't see a white swan until I went to England. Uh, in New Zealand, all swans are black. Um, the other reason I don't like it, though, is a black swan, the whole argument is very similar to Hempel's paradox using the idea of a black raven and a white raven. So I think it's kind of mislabeling something that was already well known in other domains. Nonetheless, the idea is that the market won't price significant events, extreme events that have never happened before, things that are literally unpredictable. So, I mean, that's fair enough to suppose that. There are many, many more things that can happen in the world than have happened in the world. Um, when the flash crash happened, that was literally a new thing. No one had ever seen that before. We'd seen crashes before, but we hadn't seen one that was driven by the continual selling of an algorithm. That's something humans never did. Uh, the traders in the in the SPX futures pit when they were standing on the floor were borderline criminals in the way they treated customer orders. However, the idea of them just continually putting sell orders in and punching the market lower and lower and lower, that, would, that never happened. So that would be a black swan. So it is a legitimate supposition to assume that these things are underpriced. Um, it relies on this thing called the peso problem. Um, the peso problem was so known, named because the Mexican economy used to sporadically blow up, hence the peso would have these massive jumps. And if you look at the time series of the last X number of years, you wouldn't see this massive jump in it because it happens very, very sporadically. So it's quite possible to look at a time series, decide, I don't know, Biggest move in this time series is 3%, hence there's no chance of there ever being a 10% move. And that's a mistake. The problem is the black swan advocates who jump from the peso problem to the idea that extreme events are underpriced, they don't have statistics to back that up either. Um, there is a big jump there from saying you don't know to wings are always underpriced. And I've seen a lot of academic studies that show that far out of the money options, these options that look cheap um, and would protect against black swans, are in fact the most overpriced things that exist. Uh, they're literally called lottery ticket options. Um, and like a lottery ticket, they are massively, massively overpriced for the benefit they give. Um, it is tempting, this is one of the reasons they're overpriced, is because they are cheap in dollar terms. So it's tempting to say, you know, I'll buy some Tesla 2000 calls because I can buy them for uh, 50 cents. The most I can lose is 50 cents. But it comes back again to that's the most you can lose in that particular trade. If you keep doing that, you're going to lose all of your money. There are plenty of long volatility funds that have in fact lost all of their money. Uh, we were talking before this presentation 
One of the big problems we have now with social media is that we only ever see the winners. We only ever see the long ball funds that make a ton of money during some event. And they end up on CNBC talking about how great they are. They always have a great story because there's always been some dramatic event that we remember, um, whether it was the 2008 crash, whether it was the volatility issues in February of 18, whether it was COVID, there's always a story. And the media, well, they like stories, they're storytellers. So they'll have this long ball fund on and they'll be like, yeah, we made 2,000%. It would be very rude at that point of the presenter to then say, well, how much have you actually made if I'd given you a dollar when you opened your fund? And if they ask, ask that question, the answer would almost always be a loss. Uh, long volatility funds tend to lose money. They don't lose money on any one position. They lose money because they're systematically making a bet that's incorrect. Um, and again, I'm honest about this. I do not know. One day in the future, they may be proven right. All I know is from the results we've seen so far, black swan options are horrifically overpriced. There's a very big difference. I said earlier, volatility is predictable. By that, I mean the volatility roughly where we are now. Close, that applies to options which would have deltas of these, say, 30 to 70 delta. We're talking about the meat of the distribution. We have plenty of data to estimate the shape of the meat of the distribution. It's a very different thing to say I can predict volatility to saying I know what an extreme out-of-the-money option is. So I don't know. I could be wrong. But in the past, everything we've seen so far, I'm not wrong. These are overpriced options. Um, and it's clear why, like I said, every time there's a black swan, it's a very memorable event. We always remember where we were on September 11th, uh, sorry, 2001. Literally, I do not remember where I was on September 10th, 2011, but I don't remember where I was on September 10th of 2001 either. You remember the dramatic events. So we tend to put much more weight in the impact of those events than we should. Uh, another example, Americans are more afraid of shark attacks than heart disease. Um, and if you've seen, this is true by the way, in states like Kansas, which is thousands of miles from the nearest ocean. So not only are these people not going to see a shark, they're also, well, I don't want to generalize, but they can be fat as anything, and they definitely have a very high risk of heart disease. But heart disease is a normal thing. We're used to it, so we're not worried about it. So be very, very careful if you ever think that there's some dramatic story that has changed the way the world is. It's another very tempting thing for after there being a big event, after there being the COVID thing, you'll always find people who say, okay, now we've entered a new regime of elevated volatility. I've heard that about eight different times in my career. It's never been true. It might be true for the next month, it might be true for the next year, but eventually volatility, and this is the easy thing to makes it easy to predict. Volatility will go back to being what it's always been. Okay, so if I'm saying options are overpriced, well, we're going to make some money by selling them. Um, options are usually overpriced, not just the black swan ones, where I've admitted uh, ignorance of the real situation, but at the money options. Uh, at the money options are usually overpriced. They should be, you know, I'm selling them to you. I'm not a complete idiot. I'll sell them to you knowing that you have all the upside. So I want to be compensated for that asymmetric risk. And as a result, options are overpriced, usually. But usually doesn't mean always. And this is the problem again. You have to know volatility is mispriced in the case you're dealing with. Otherwise, you don't have an edge by selling options. Um, 
even if you're right on average, you have to make your absolute best effort in every single case. Are you right in this case? So when I say volatility is predictable, all right, I've told you, now go and do the work. Actually put the work of predicting volatility into action. Theta is not an edge. So this brings me to the Theta gang, a very well-known sort of group of options traders who have come across this idea that you just always sell options and collect Theta. Theta is not an edge. It, the only way Theta would be an edge is if literally you were the only person who knew that options tend to be worth less as time goes by. Um, everyone knows that. And in fact, the basis of every single option pricing model is that the profits you make from Theta are exactly offset by the losses you will make as the stock moves around. The only way there's an edge is if the stock doesn't move around enough to, as that is reflected in the option price. So you always need a volatility edge. Um, the other mistake the Theta gang make is they sell far out of the money options, particularly they'll sell a far out of the money struck iron condor. So they might sell the 20 delta, 20 delta strangle and buy the 5 delta, 5 delta strangle. Well, first, as we know, buying those 5 delta options tends to be the worst thing you can do. They tend to be the most overpriced thing, so you're already making a mistake there. The other problem you've got is a bit more subtle. Even if you're wrong about volatility, if you sell options that are far enough out of the money, usually you're going to make money. And that's because of the modal PL is very different from the average PL. The average PL is what drives the accumulation of money into your account. The mode is the thing you see most often. If you sell a very, very far out of the money strangle, most of the time you will collect all of the premium. So here's just a quick example I did, $100 stock. We're going to sell a one-year 70, 130 strangle. If the implied volatility is 30% and the realized vol is 40%, you can show that the median P&L, the mode P&L in this case as well, is $5, which is I make $5 which is exactly the initial value of the strangle. In most cases, this strangle goes out worthless and I make money. But I've actually made a terrible trade here. I have sold something for 30 when its value was 40. Eventually that catches up for me. Even though 65% of the time I make the maximum amount of money, sometimes I'll get absolutely killed. My average P&L is very, very negative. So that's the problem with choosing strangles to sell instead of straddles. It gives you bad feedback. It's very important, I could have put this as one of the mistakes people make, it's very important to analyze your trades after you've done them. We all like to think experience is a source of learning. But it's only a source of learning if you make the effort to go through and actively look at what you've done and why it worked or why it didn't. Uh, incidentally, I usually get asked, how do we automate that process, which is completely missing the point. When you're analyzing your trades, when you're analyzing your results, it's much, much better if you do it as slow as possible. Do it, write it down on a bit of paper. Active learning like that is far more effective than having some script that pulls out all your results. Eventually, you'll stop looking at it. Um, that's just the way the human mind works. So some things can be made algorithmic. Looking at results, do it as slowly as is practical. But anyway, if you're selling options, it's much, much better because of that to sell straddles. Your winning percentage won't be as high even when you're right, but you'll get much, much better feedback. Okay, this is one of the specific problems that options traders make. 
they do a trade, the trade goes against them, and then they're like, well, how do I repair this position? Uh, repairing a position is missing the point of why you've got a position on in the first place. It doesn't matter what your position was. That's all over. That's, that's happened in the past. The question you have to always ask yourself is, given what I now know, what is the position I want? And if that's not the position you have, change things. It doesn't matter. You don't need to keep some of your old position. And the more attached you get to your old position, the more unlikely it is that you get the actual position that you really would want. So it's important to always think, not what I've made in the past on this position, not what I've lost in the past. Knowing what I know now, what should I do? And literally, that's what you should do, regardless of what position you have. Trading costs should be taken into account, but that's a secondary factor. Which brings me to this. If you ever think you've found a situation where you have so much edge that you don't need to worry about costs, you're wrong about one of those things. Um, my friend Augustin Lebron summarized it as his law of conservation of difficulty. If you're trading a market, say SPY options, they are incredibly tight. Uh, if you do spreads, you can get them basically filled mid market. There's very low transaction costs. However, you're very unlikely to find a significant edge. It's the most liquid market in the world. Everyone looks at it. The costs will be low because the edge is low. Uh, conversely, it's quite easy to find edges in garbage little $5 stocks. And then you look at the options and you'll find the bid ask spread on the option is also $5. So that's a situation where the costs are prohibitive relative to the edge. So you should always most traders would do much better if they focused on reducing costs more than improving edge. Most traders will find a basic edge and then look to refine it, look to refine it, look to refine it, and that's great, you should. But before you do that, get your costs down as low as possible. Um, if you don't, if it's, not, it's not just me just telling you that, that's mathematically a fact. If you remove costs, costs have no variance. Removing costs is like having a sh boosting your sharp ratio with another infinite sharp ratio. The cost is a return with no variance to it. So if you're, if you're for example, choosing a broker, oftentimes people will be like, I want to choose the broker who gives me the best analytics, has a good API I can write to. These are all good things. The most important thing though is the costs. So I know it's very fashionable now to make fun of Robinhood um, and because they sell their order flow to market makers. That doesn't matter to me. Um, but it doesn't matter to me whether Thomas Peterfee at IB or Ken Griffin at Citadel is getting rich off my order. What matters to me is the amount of costs I'm paying. Uh, payment for order flow has made the markets, if anything, more efficient, but it's reduced the costs to me. Uh, from an outside trader, it's probably a good thing. Anyway, if I've told you to think of costs as a very important thing, you may then say, well, in that case, I'm just never going to cross the bid ask. I'm going to always try and sell on the offer. I'm always going to try and buy on the bid. This is a colossal mistake. Unless you're a market maker, in which case that is the entire source of your edge, restricting yourself like that is the wrong thing to do. It's much better to do more trades with a lower expected value than to do fewer higher expected value trades. You should always come up with your strategy by including all of the costs. You should assume you're selling the bid and buying the offer. Um, and if you have an edge there, that's great because that's what you need to do if you want to get into a trade. And it's not just that you will miss trades, Sometimes, if you're sitting on the bed, you want to buy, and the market goes away from you, you don't get filled. Well, that's sad. You've missed a good trade. It's worse than that. Um, so Robot James, who you should all follow on Twitter if you don't, uh, who has a great skill of making complicated things seem simple, um, 
in the in the tweets he talks about the market that is uh, he also talks about a bunch of other stuff that you might want to ignore um he points out that if you try and always buy on the bid or sell on the offer you're not just missing good trades you're guaranteeing you're going to get all of the bad trades because whatever model you have it's a vastly simplified version of the market no matter how good your model is, you're going to be missing some things. And those things you're missing are going to be in someone else's model. So even though you see that the trade is good, you think you should be selling on the offer, someone who knows more than you might just come along and lift your offer and they've got positive expected value on that trade. This is adverse selection is an enormous problem and it's one that's very difficult to see in back tests. I'm not sure you can see it in a back test, but you just have to, on a philosophical level, think through the situation and realize that that is the case. So this is our overall PL. And if we have a good forecast, this is when we're right, we make more wins than we lose. But if our forecast is bad, it's exactly the opposite. So the bet we're making is we do a lot more of these good trades then we pick up, are picked off on the bad trades. And to do that, whenever you think you have a good trade, you have to do it. You can't just try to always sell the offer. That's also known in the, back in the floor trading days as being a deck for attack. Like, well done, you, may, you might have made an extra one cent, but because you were trying to get that extra one cent, you've just missed a dollar payment. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about, and this, this came about after I was speaking about this presentation to some other people. These are some of the things people expect from options trading. And it's a complete, if I told you, you can watch a YouTube video and become a brain surgeon, you would think I'm insane. People think, they can watch a few YouTube videos and become professional quality options traders, and it's equally insane. It's not impossible to learn trading. The markets aren't efficient, but they are very, very difficult. If you don't have realistic expectations, you're going to overtrade, you're going to trade too big. Trading too big is mathematically, it can be mathematically proven, it's going to eventually make you lose all your money. I've seen a lot of people in my DMs saying, look, all I need is a trade that wants to make 1% a week. I mean, that trade doesn't exist. That means you'd be happy with nearly making 68% a year. If, I'm not the best trader in the world, but I'm all right. If, if I have a year where I make 50%, I think that's wonderful. That's not going to be my average. That's wonderful when I'm trading on a red T account, say. Obviously, as a professional, you can get much better margin, your numbers can be bigger. You are not just by trading small going to find some magical edge that will make you make 1% a week. It's generally no more difficult to make 2% than 1%. You just trade bigger, right? The problem is these trades don't exist. The other one I heard recently was, well, I can go through all that, so I pointed out someone who'd written a book uh, where you can do these strategies and they work. And the objection was, well, I have to do all that work and I get a sharp ratio of one. Who wants to do that? Um, well, Warren Buffett would go for that. When Warren Buffett was at his peak, so early 70s to mid 90s, his sharp ratio was 0.75. So what you're telling me is you want, by doing a few bits of work on a spreadsheet, to have a better risk reward number than Warren Buffett. Again, completely unrealistic. And furthermore, not only are these things not going to happen, you don't even really want them to happen. It's much better for you to have 10 small edges, which you put together into a portfolio of edges, than to have one big one. If you have one big edge, it's not going to last. Uh, edges like that, everyone else is going to notice them as well they're going to disappear. Whereas there are small edges in the market that have been there forever. And they're going to be there forever because they're small. On their own, they might not be able to beat transaction costs, but if you combine them with 10 others, 
maybe they can. That's the thing you want to look for. You want to look for a lot of small things that go your way, which comes back to the original premise that I had was you have to work on the details. You will never find a system that is so good, it doesn't matter what you do. Um, so that's sort of my conclusion. My other conclusion was exactly what I said to the organizers when they asked me to speak. They said, can you talk at an algo trading conference? So first, no. Most things are options. You don't need to trade algorithmically. But second, I have a major problem with someone who says they want to be an algo trader or they want to be an options trader. You're looking at the problem the wrong way around. What you want to do is make money. The way you're going to do that is by being a trader. If you find an edge that involves trading options or should be executed algorithmically, by all means do those. But starting as an algo trader is starting with the tool rather than the problem. The problem you have to find or solve is to find edge. Starting with being an algo trader, starting with being an options trader, the wrong way around. I do this too. Um, because I've been an options trader so long, I'll sometimes have an idea and I'm like, well, this has got edge, this is great. And then I'll think, well, what option strategy do I use to implement this? Uh, that's the wrong way around. Sometimes an option is not the right way to do it. Uh, an option always, you should only trade if you have a volatility view. And that makes them harder than trading Delta One products like stocks or futures. Stocks or futures, you need to be right about direction. With options, you always need to be about, right about volatility as well. So if you're trading directionally, Honestly, if you're trading directionally, don't trade options. There you go. That's the biggest mistake you can make. It summarizes almost all of these things in one go. I didn't mean to be that negative. If you want to be a volatility trader, trading straddles or strangles, that's great. Because you know what? That's easier. But if you think, particularly if you think you can make money consistently buying options, um, just, I mean, you're wrong. You just can't. You might over a short period, but again, that's not a likely outcome. Um, you're watching YouTube, you're watching Twitter, you'll always see the people who've made tons of money. They are, again, not the modal result. So if you want to trade options to trade volatility, go ahead, absolutely great, but do the work to predict volatility. And if you only want to trade direction, probably don't trade options. So that is my depressing conclusion from that 40 minute rant. And I don't know if any of you feel better, but I'm glad I got some of that off my chest. Thank you for this eye-opening session, Dr. Sinclair. So we will now start picking questions from the audience and uh, please put uh, your questions in the questions panel now. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I'll share my screen. All right, so yeah, meanwhile, uh, uh, I would like to share one for the one last time uh, about the upcoming anniversary sale. Starting uh, tomorrow, we'll be offering 75% discount on all Quantra courses. Uh, this offer will start early for all the conference attendees uh, with uh, additional benefits. And uh, uh, attendees of this conference uh, can avail additional 20% discount on top of existing offer by just using coupon code 75 plus 20. And uh, uh, also check out this uh, learning track on uh, quantitative approach in futures and options trading. Uh, you might uh, find it helpful. Uh, uh, and uh, with that, uh, I think now we'll move on to the questions. So in questions, uh, let me share questions with Dr. Sinclair as well. Mm. All right. And uh, wonderful. So, okay. So I'll start picking uh, some of these questions one by one. So, uh, 
Wow, that's a long list of questions from Ashraf. Uh, we we'll probably uh, try uh, picking some for some of them. So, all right. So Ashraf asks: uh, Is there uh, cases where uh, price of an option can be largely attributed to the skew element rather than volatility itself? For example, in your experience, does options price mainly driven by volatility in dollars and cents rather than skew most of the time? Yeah, it's. I've never seen a situation where everything's entirely driven by skew. Um, in a statistical sense, if you're talking about the moments of the distribution of the underlying skew and variance, are different things. Once you're talking about the price of the option and the implied volatility curve, uh, it's very difficult to disentangle those two effects. And what we call skew in the implied curve is really almost always driven by the correlation between volatility and the underlying movement. So skew itself is almost something that you can ignore, not completely, but almost. And that's another fallacy of options is that things are mainly driven by these hope, you know, higher order moments and they are really almost never is that the case. Okay, and I think also I, I'll pick the last uh, part of that question, and that talks about. Uh, lastly, do you advocate using uh, uh, RL agents in the active approach to trading options? Uh, have books of both sides on put and calls on different correlated or non-correlated underlines. Where is that? Who's that by? What timestamp is that? Because that's a long question. Um, uh, it's in the same question. So this uh, uh, okay. the question that I flagged. So the last question, if you see at the bottom, in in the same in this in the same question, there it's a bunch of questions. Uh, I do not see it. I'm sorry. It was a very long question. I mean, this. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to ignore that unless you answer it, ask it again. Um, sorry, I can't see that. Sure. No issues. I think we can move to the next question. And that is again from him only. So would you mind sharing with us here fund maximum DD during the last two crisis period, 2020 and 2008? Only if you uh, I want to answer that. Um, I, I cannot answer the first one because at the time I was trading in a market making firm and I don't know how the rest of the firm was doing. Uh, market makers in general do really well when there's a volatile event because it means they do more trades and volatility can be thought of as speeding up time. So market makers have an advantage. If time speeds up, it basically is like playing blackjack where the deal is faster. Uh, it's good for them, they get to make more bets in the same amount of time. So practically any market maker who knows what they're doing will make money in that situation. In 2020, I had a fund uh, and we did we did relatively well early on. We made uh, about 30% in March, I believe, but it was a long time ago, I don't really remember. Um, but we, we did well. Typically, unless you're purely a vol seller, and if, if you're agile enough, typically mark periods of market turbulence should be good for you. Okay, so uh, I hope your questions are answered, Ashraf. Uh, this next question is an interesting one from Aaron. So Aaron asks, uh, 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 thank you for your time, Yuan. Uh, can you talk about the short borrow rate and uh, its effect on the price of the option? Yeah, okay, so the short borrow rate is essentially acting as like a dividend. It's like, it's, it's a negative interest rate. Um, you are not going to find a situation where there's an arb between the short borrow rate in the stock 
and the options. So doing a synthetic stock in the options. The market makers price that in. Uh, it may not be exactly the rate that you are charged because this varies from broker to broker, but um, it's almost certainly the difference won't be big enough for you to cover costs. So essentially it just acts like a negative interest rate. Okay, so uh, I hope that answers your question, Aaron. Uh, the next question is, uh, Yuan, uh, can you give some example of adjacent options? Uh, maybe uh, one you use to trade, but uh, don't work anymore. Um, yeah, okay, so I'll give you a spe specific one and then a slightly more general one. Um, so specifically, look for situations where there is a timed a timed event of uncertainty. So like an election, uh, FOMC meeting, um, something like that. And it used to be very easy to make money with stock earnings announcements if you just sold the straddle right before the earnings announcement came out and then bought it back. Because you're dealing with a situation of uncertainty and people pay too much for that. That trade basically doesn't work anymore. Um, I think too many people figured it out. I stupidly told a bunch of people. Uh, I don't care usually about telling people things, but I think in that case, I didn't help myself. Uh, so that would be a timed event of uncertainty is almost always a good time to sell options. Um, and there's the, the classic, the variance premium in the options on indices and stocks in particular, almost always overpriced. So it's quite easy to come up with strategies involving selling options uh, based on that. So uh, I hope uh, your question is answered, Eric. Uh, there is this next question, and uh, this one again is about: uh, uh, Is it even possible for an individual trader to find edges? Surely the market makers and big institutions will find them much faster as they go away. Yeah, in terms of a genuine inefficiency, um, where it's something that will go away once people notice it's pretty unlikely you're going to find that. But there are risk premia you can work with. So those two trades I just told you about are examples of risk premia. Um, they won't go away because they're built, on, they're built on a solid fact that people pay for insurance. Um, and just like when you insure your house, you're not an idiot, but you pay more than the actuarial value because for you, getting your house burned down is a disaster. For the insurance company, they don't care. So something like that, anything involving a risk premium, I mean, it, it, it ebbs and flows. It hasn't been particularly great recently. I mean, by that I mean over the last couple of years. But anything involving a risk premium is pretty much there just sitting there for you, which I guess the analogy would be stocks. You could say, you know, can an individual trader make money buying stocks? But the S&P's increased by 8% a year. So yeah, the answer is yes, you can. Put your money in the S&P. Uh, in the same way with options, yeah, you can. Volatility is usually overpriced. In both cases, it's a risk premium. But you've got to be, uh, you've got to be realistic. Like I had someone recently tell me with a straight face that they thought, I can't remember the stock, it was some US mega stock. They thought it was 230% underpriced. I mean, the chances of that happening is zero. Um, so you're not going to make 230%. But, you know, if you're realistic, yeah, you definitely can. So uh, I hope uh, that answers your question, Jeff. Uh, the next question that I have is from Frank. Uh, could you highlight some use cases of using AI on options trading? Uh, no. <laughs> Okay. I, don't, uh, I, I don't use AI. Um, I, I, there are obviously some AI firms out there who trade options, but none of the specialist option firms I know specifically rely on AI. It doesn't. It seems to again be a case where you've got a tool and you want to apply it, rather than that is the natural tool you need for the problems you have. Okay. Uh... This question is an interesting one from David Hall. So David asks, uh, that was an epic rant. Uh, 
in a recent publication you indicated skepticism around uh, uh, trading volatility around earning events can you elaborate um yeah i just mean it's nowhere near as good as it used to be um i i made lots of money on that maybe six or seven years ago but the market's changed a lot there are now weekly options they used to only be monthlies in most cases um liquidity there are a lot more options with penny bit ask spread it's easier to get executed that trade itself is more well known um, there's still edge in it but it's not nearly as good as it was to the point where if i just found out about it now i'm not sure i'd start doing it i hope uh, uh, you got your answer david uh, this next question is from george norwood so george asks uh, I fall directly in the camp of Theta Gang. I typically trade once a week. I'm quite interested in using algo methods to manage portfolio optimization. What are your views on using algo tools for optimization versus active trading? Well, if you're trading once a week, you don't need you don't need any algo in terms of your execution. Um, or if you do, a lot of brokerages now have pretty good tools. Like it used to be, you know, it used to be you had to write your own VWAP, whereas now every brokerage will have a built-in VWAP that's better than what you can do. And it's similar for most execution stuff now, to be honest. Um, in terms of portfolio optimization, I don't think you really need anything particularly funky in terms of machine learning or AI or anything. Uh, the tricky bit you have with portfolio optimization and options is in the, the mathematics about the distributions. The distributions are very much non-normal. So you can't use, say, just mean variance optimization. But there are tools out there for that. If you go on SSRN and look up portfolio construction and then look for papers that mention skewness and ketosis, that would be where I would start. So I hope George, you got your question. I got your question answered. So this next question uh, is from Ben. Ben Okopnik. Uh, the question is: uh, I realize this is a broad question, but in what areas would you look for edge? Hardware, obviously, it's an obvious one. But macro, technical analysis, fundamental analysis, etc., just don't seem to make any sense. Yeah, that isn't really as negative as I made it out to be. It's really just a matter of, you have to start with some sort of concept, a very, the thing to do is to start with an observation that is so clearly true that your specific analysis of it doesn't matter. So this is where, for example, technical analysis goes wrong. Trend following is absolutely a perfect strategy if the thing you're doing has a trend. So stocks go up. Like I've said that S&P goes up 8% a year on average. So trend following that makes sense because there's a trend. But the thing I've started with is that observation. Then the exact method I use for following the trend comes later. So the way that's the way I would do it is like I would look for things that broadly are true. Volatility is overpriced when there's a timed market event. Volatility on indices tends to be overpriced. Risk reversals, selling the put, and buying the call, that tends to be a good trade as well. That Those out of the money calls around the 20, 30 delta, usually underpriced. So just very broad things like that. Um, and you can construct things based on those observations. Like a covered call, uh, for example, is just a combination of those two observations. Volatility is overpriced, so I'll sell an option. Stocks tend to go up, so I'll buy some stocks. Uh, but if you if you want ideas, just the place I would read would be SSRN. Okay, so uh, the next question is uh, uh, by Ayan. So Ayan asks, uh, what is the best way of constructing of a portfolio of negatively screw, skewed uh, short volume strategy and a positively skewed long volume strategy? 
what is the best top down mental model for this uh hang on who said that where was that it's uh, ayan yuxel okay um i don't know that there's a particularly interesting mental model for that uh to me that would just be a case of constructing a portfolio using standard portfolio optimization tools one of the problems with those, though, is you'll find most of these option strategies are very highly correlated. So you don't gain an awful lot from the diversification factors. And another problem is you will end up with it telling you to put all of your money in one of your things. Uh, so you, you generally have to put lots of overlays on top to do that. But there's no special magic. Um, one thing I will say, though, is if you're doing that, I, I often have long vol strategies with zero edge. Um, I love those, they're fine, because they let me hedge against short vol strategies. So you get your edge from the short vol strategy. The long vol strategy, you don't expect to lose money or make money, but it's a risk control thing. So that's the only thing I would say that's sort of different about option portfolios. It's, it's very easy to find short vol strategies. It's much harder to find long vol strategies. All right, uh, so we uh, will just ask last two questions. And uh, this one is uh, more from the career uh, uh, point of view. So Aditya asks, uh, what roadmap or path would recommend uh, a beginner to, you would recommend uh, to a beginner to get into options trading for someone who only trades scripts, should they first try forward futures or before actively trading options? Uh Okay, so there's two things there. I'll take the first one, for, the second one first. Um, you don't really need to trade futures before you trade options. Um, knowing about how options behave uh, is, is enough to trade options directly. And if you're trading, I would rather trade options and trade volatility like straddles and strangles. I think you've got a much better chance of making that work than trading futures directionally. Uh, the exception would be VIX futures because they're also a volatility product. They tend to be quite predictable as well. Um, in terms of a roadmap, uh, you should basically learn about, the hard bit about options is there's a lot of technical stuff to learn at the start in terms of what the Greeks mean, in terms of structures, nomenclature and stuff. There's no edge in any of this stuff, but you have to learn how it works. It's, it's, these are like instruments on a plane. They don't tell, they're not the thing that makes the plane fly, but they're vital to the pilot. So, I don't know, you should probably start off, honestly, by reading my first book, the one called Option Trading. It's designed to take you from start to being a competent trader. So, I mean, if I, if I knew of a better one, I wouldn't have written that one. So, uh, that's a very valuable advice, uh, Aditya, that you have got from... Uh, Dr. Sinker. Uh, so yeah, I'll combine three questions uh, in this last question. And these are asked by uh, Matthew Seco, Dan Martin, and uh, Jeff Dalkey. So these questions are, uh, do you have any recommendation on sources on uh, sources of academic papers that uh, uh, discuss options trading? Then uh, important info, can you recommend any specific books that covers that? And the last one is also, uh, very much appreciate your published work and presentations. What's next? What are you up to lately? Um, okay, so three so questions combined. Yeah. For academic papers, you've got to look at SSRN, um, SSRN.com. Uh, do a search for volatility options. Uh, I check that at least twice a week. Um, I would say I skim the. I'd, I'd say I skim about ten to fifteen abstracts every week. Of those, I might read the full paper maybe once every two weeks. But that's where I would start. Google Scholar is good if you're looking for specific stuff. It's not as good for browsing. Um, what was the next question? The, uh, the next question is, what are you up to? <laughs> uh, um, actually, apart from my books that I want to, I think you should read, to be honest, there's another one called Trading Volatility by Colin Bennett, which is good. Um, I can't. There's probably a few others that I've left out. Oh, 
Augustin LeBron's book, uh, The Laws of Trading, is definitely worth reading. It goes through a lot of the stuff that I kind of talked about here today in a much more general sort of way. You'll get a lot out of that. I got a lot out of it, and I had 20 years' experience when I read it. Um, what am I up to now? I mean, I sort of retired maybe six or seven years ago and then found that I was spending all my time during the day trading options. So whether I claim I'm doing this as a job or just as a hobby, it always comes back to this. So I think probably this is it for me now. Um, I'll keep trading options. I'll write the occasional paper. Um, I've kind of settled into that. Works for me. And uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, that's uh, about it. And uh, we have uh, now uh, concluded the uh, Algo Trading Conference. So this was the final session. And a uh, 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 thank you from the bottom of our heart to uh, Dr. Sinclair for taking out, taking out his time and uh, sharing uh, all his uh, experience and learnings from over the years. And he has shared uh, uh, some amazing, uh, valuable lessons for the uh, starters, especially the ones who want to explore career opportunities in the option side. So thank you so much, Dr. Sinclair. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we look forward to host you in future sometime for some another session on options trading. Thanks very much for having me. As you can see, I put a lot of effort into getting dressed up, tidied up my office. I really appreciate, <laughs> the, uh, appreciate the opportunity.